Assalamu alaikum khawatin hasrat wasim asan welcomes you to lecture number 10 of marketing for non profits mkt 628 at the virtual university of pakistan the component of learning i'm going to talk about right away is on drivers of behavior change in other words i'm going to talk about all those factors responsible for uh, manifesting the consumer behavior consumers show while they make a purchase decision in the context of uh, non-profit environment the consumers have to make a decision about whether they are going to change their behavior opting for a certain program or not therefore it is extremely important for the marketer to understand why consumers behave the way they do until he has that kind of understanding there is no way that he can come up with the right strategic marketing plan because a lack of understanding of the consumer is not going to let the marketer move forward in terms of the strategic process consumer behavior is um, a complex phenomena it uh, develops over time it does not form itself overnight very quickly it is something which is an evolution and uh, the factors that basically are responsible for uh, the behavior are your personality perceptions the values and beliefs we all have a um, certain outlook toward life and uh, that is the internal phenomenon of everybody's personality the way they look at uh, things at life and then there is a certain mechanism which figures itself the ones who respond to the external phenomena thereby forming our personality traits uh, giving way to uh, developing our perceptions and then building certain values and beliefs the ones that we have a set of um, values and beliefs that influences the way we behave and the way we make decisions whether to opt for a program or not opt for a program the fact remains that um, the marketing people have to undertake a lot of effort trying to reveal what exactly uh, triggers such influences and uh, the studies carried out by the different with the marketing people tell us that uh, they all have to look into the areas of sociology psychology um, and demographics in particular because uh, these are uh, the variables with which uh, when put together form a very good uh, ground for the research design that you put together to carry out marketing research and to find out what these influences are and how they come into play and uh, then let people behave the way they do we all know that uh, the marketing basically is a combination of so many disciplines and therefore we call it an eclectic discipline it draws on um, certain properties of uh, sociology um, psychology demographics economics statistics and therefore um, marketing people could have to look at uh, all those variables which are helpful to come up with uh, the right kind of uh, the marketing research to unearth all the factors responsible for uh, driving the consumer behavior and uh, i would summarize it by saying that uh, without understanding this consumer behavior um, the marketer is at a loss to come up with the right plan central to the consumer behavior is another phenomenon which we call the role of exchange the fact of the matter is that uh, until the time an exchange has taken place the behavior of the consumer is not fully manifested the consumer shows his behavior by taking his time 
going through the exchange process and then deciding or not deciding in favor of the one with which the marketing people would want him to establish. In other words, if marketing people would want the consumers to quit smoking, then consumers have to go through a certain process whereby they weigh the costs they have to pay and the benefits they derive by paying those costs. To explain this phenomenon, I'm going to come up with uh, quite a few examples which I'm going to talk about rather uh, elaborately so that uh, we all have uh, an understanding uh, very clear about uh, the concept I'm talking about. Nothing moves in terms of the exchange until the consumer has shown his behavior by way of weighing costs versus the benefits. What are the costs in an NPO environment and what are the kind of benefits which uh, the target market enjoys by paying those costs? Let's talk about uh, the different examples one by one. Well, you are there to donate blood for a noble cause and the cost that you pay for doing that is the time you have gone through right from the point you left your home to the point the process is complete and you have donated the blood. You have also gone through a process of a little bit of pain, but uh, the fact is that uh, the cost that you have uh, paid toward all that is the inconvenience. The benefit that you get uh, in return is a great satisfaction on your part for serving a very noble cause because you know that your blood is going to save you know, a few lives. And uh, the cost is less than the benefit which you perceive is much higher. So until the time you are convinced as a consumer that the benefit that you have uh, derived out of the cost that you have paid is far greater than the cost themselves, you are not going to change your behavior. So that you are actuated to take a certain decision and to start behaving in a certain way only when you are convinced that the benefits are going to far exceed the costs. Another example of uh, the, this phenomenon is um, quitting smoking. There is uh, an NPO, and you are a part of that, that is working on a program for motivating people to quit smoking. And a smoker uh, the pays a certain cost when he goes through the process of exchange. Let's take a look at his cost. Well, the sacrifices you know, he gives in terms of saying goodbye to a certain set of values and um, a certain set of uh, habits which he has formed over a number of years is the cost that he pays toward changing his behavior. And once the behavior stands changed, meaning once he has quit smoking, he derives a tremendous benefit of feeling a little healthier and having the feeling that he's going to have um, maybe a longer, healthier life to lead. And um, that is the benefit which is perceived by the consumer. An NPO the working for improving the environment of a particular city or of a particular locality starts emphasizing on having a greener place. And there are activists who are working on this particular exercise and they are convincing people to be aware of the benefits of a greener environment. People who don't really care about greenery, they cut trees and they think vegetation is no good. As a matter of fact, you see, it is kind of an eyesore, a very weird kind of a feeling, of course. But the fact remains that there are people who are not really for a greener environment. Either they don't like it or they are not aware of the benefits of having a greener or living in a greener environment. So this is the kind of awareness which marketing people have to create and generate for people to be sensitive to the cause the marketing people are working for and working on. When you convince people or your team of activists convince people um, of the outcome of a greener environment and you think that people have changed their behaviors and they have started working on all those factors responsible uh, for making the environment the greener, um, you generate a kind of achievement and a sense of satisfaction on part of all those who have been a part of that exercise, meaning the target market who has started behaving in that particular way because they know that if not immediately, 
somewhere down the road, the environment is going to look much better than it is today and which is going to be healthier for not only them, but also for the coming generations. Another example of um, cost versus benefit is uh, that of uh, the food bank. Let us go back uh, to the hypothetical situation of a food bank that has the mission to alleviate uh, hunger or to contribute toward alleviating hunger in a certain locality. The costs uh, the people have to pay for accepting meals uh, which are distributed either free of cost or at a subsidized price uh, is something which you may find very interesting. But the fact remains that there is a cost, even when they pay or they don't pay. The cost is a compromise which they might perceive of their self-respect, self-dignity, and self-worth. They, they may start thinking that uh, accepting these kind of meals is going to be below their dignity, and uh, they are going to be a focus of criticism or uh, maybe sarcasm by all those who are associated with them. What's going to happen if people, their friends, their family members find out that they are accepting food which is being distributed free of cost, or for that matter, at subsidized rates? So you need to have a team of uh, marketing people, uh, volunteers you know, who are uh, activists, um, who are trying to convince people uh, most of the time to start accepting the kind of food which you have uh, started distributing. Let us go to the other example of uh, the nursing home and uh, to take an analytical look at uh, the factors I just uh, talked about in terms of self-dignity, self-respect, and uh, self-worth. You may have to undertake a very extensive effort trying to convince the people who happen to be relatives, friends, or family members of uh, the elderly people who you think should be spending their latest years at your nursing home or at the facility where you have taken upon yourselves to uh, offer medical and nursing care. Not only medical and nursing care, but also the other um, social activities which you think if uh, you make your residents a part of are going to play a very positive role toward the remainder of their life span. You want to give them um, a feeling that uh, they are still relevant to the society and they have come to the nursing home uh, not to count uh, the remaining days and wait for the terminal point of their life. Rather, they have come there to enjoy life. And uh, for that, it is not them that you're going to convince. That you have to carry out an exercise to convince their uh, near ones and dear ones. So these people, once they are convinced of the operational efficiencies of your facility and of the mission of your program, um, are then going to allow their elderly uh, relatives to enroll themselves as residents of the facility that you're running. An important point that you might have noticed in this example is very similar to the one that I talked about previously on the food bank. And that is the involvement of people who do not really happen to be your target market, but uh, the part of the target audience, overall audience, and people who are working either as volunteers or activists or, you know, any set of those individuals who may have influence over the real target market. Uh, we have seen that uh, the role of exchange is very important and, and very central to uh, the concept of consumer behavior and uh, therefore uh, costs and benefits that uh, I've talked about in relation to all these examples happen to be the two biggest drivers of consumer behavior. Even in the uh, latest uh, the two examples that I just talked about, uh, the costs that uh, the people pay are much lower than the benefits they derive by getting uh, uh, enrolled to the programs that you're offering. Uh, either as the food bank or as the nursing home. So until the time your target market is convinced that um, their benefits are going to far exceed the cost that they have paid uh, toward any program uh, that you may talk about, um, they are not going to change their behavior or they're not going to manifest a change in the behavior which they may change somewhere along the line. Don't forget the fact that the job of the marketer is to influence the behavior 
and influence the behavior in a way that the market ends up changing it. There is no guarantee that the behavior will automatically change. We can safely say that um, costs and benefits happen to be two very important drivers of the behavior change. But experts think that um, these two are accompanied by two more factors that uh, they come to their help and uh, complete the model of, for the behavior change. And I'm going to show you that model with the help of a little uh, graphical presentation, which is going to make clear what those uh, the factors are in addition to costs and benefit. Let's take a look at that. Here on this slide, as uh, you can see, we have customer right in the center because customer happens to be the focus of the whole activity. And it goes without saying that we are talking about a customer-centered approach. The very first driver is the benefits, which you see on the right-hand side on top and designated as B. I'll tell you the why I'm starting with benefits and not costs. If you move leftwards counterclockwise, you see costs also influencing the customer. So this is what I talked about, costs versus benefits. Customers have to pay a certain cost in order to derive certain benefits, and those benefits have to be much greater than their perception of the cost which they pay toward bringing about a change in their established behavior. And this cost factor is designated as C. And we are moving from right to left, counterclockwise. You go a little downwards, you see there is a factor which says others. Here, I'm going to talk about all those constituents who are responsible in the example of the food bank for convincing people that uh, accepting from the food bank is not below their dignity. So they are the people who are known as others. In the example that I gave you on the nursing home, all those activists or all those friends, relatives, and family members of the prospective residents of the nursing home are going to form this particular classification, which is others, and designated as O. So in other words, that we have seen here is, uh, as per the experts claim, that uh, it is not just the costs and benefits that uh, are the prime uh, drivers of uh, consumer behavior or uh, staging a change in consumer behavior via influencing their behavior. It also are two more factors, one of which happens to be others. So in other words, the role played by other people in this kind of an equation is extremely important and alongside costs and benefits, they play their respective role. When you move uh, rightwards, you see the fourth factor of self-efficacy designated as S. This is a factor which, according to experts, states that um, the people in many instances are confident of uh, bringing about a change in their behavior because they are aware of the consequences of not changing the behavior. Like, you see, if they happen to be smokers, they know that smoking is not good for health. And therefore, bringing about a change with by quitting smoking toward their behavior is something positive and something healthy, something that the people or their peers are going to approve of. But still, these people have certain inhibitions which keep them from bringing about that change which is desired by the marketer. And therefore, the job of the marketer here is to give the kind of final push to the thinking process of the target market so that uh, it can bring about the change which otherwise it thinks it can uh, bring about by itself. So why wait for the target market to act on their own? Uh, the marketing people in these kinds of situations could jump in and they give the final push to the thinking process of um, the target market. By doing so, they are um, actuating the target market to uh, make the final decision about uh, the behavior change and uh, something which the, the market thinks they can do by themselves. Um, uh, they have the confidence of uh, achieving the desired results. The marketing people give it a push and uh, they make it happen in a way that uh, consumers 
uh, have this uh, positive thinking that Tagada Day played a positive role toward influencing themselves and bringing about the desired change. As long as the marketing people can um, achieve their uh, results, it doesn't really matter who gets the credit. And uh, in this kind of a situation, I think a smart marketing person would like to give credit to uh, its target market. The credit can be given uh, by uh, having uh, certain testimonials as part of the communication campaign uh, where uh, uh, the customers can talk about uh, the behavioral change uh, brought about in their, uh, uh, through their uh, thought process and also uh, making uh, the, the marketing people get the part of uh, the, the joint effort get the which get the was get the put together uh, to uh, the bring about that particular change. These two factors, others and self-efficacy, work hand in hand get the with costs and benefits. And through the examples that we have seen that uh, get the others uh, get the play uh, a very important role, uh, whether that we are dealing with a situation like the food bank or uh, the nursing home, uh, the fact remains uh, that the role of others is extremely important. Now, this role can be positive as well as negative. So what happens when their role is negative? Well, the U.S. marketing people have got to put together a campaign or put together certain efforts with which you can um, um, exert uh, upon uh, the uh, target audience that is against uh, your interests in a way that uh, they get convinced. Which means that um, in such situations, the U.S. marketing people have got to convince not just the target market, but also the broader environment, the broader target audience. And that target audience consists of others. And these others form some very significant constituents of the whole uh, the setup. And until these constituents are taken on board, um, your objective uh, they cannot be uh, fulfilled and your goals uh, will not uh, uh, be scored, and therefore the drivers of um, consumer behavior are extremely important to understand so that uh, the U.S. Uh, the marketing experts can put together a strategic plan uh, which reflects uh, the, your uh, analytical thinking in terms of consumer behavior and uh, what really drives that consumer behavior. Having understood the value of the role of exchange, uh, we now move on to another set of learning that is about types of exchanges because we already have seen the central role of exchange toward consumer behavior and the impact it has uh, when consumer manifests you know, his uh, the behavior uh, while uh, opting for a program and not opting for a program and uh, we are talking mostly positively and therefore let's talk about uh, the changing uh, his behavior uh, and uh, the making the, the marketing uh, people's uh, the mission achievable and implementable. Uh, coming to types of exchanges, which is the topic of the component, uh, let me tell you that uh, there are uh, two different kinds of exchanges. The one is what you call two-party exchange and the other is multiple-party exchange. So in other words, depending upon your situation and the program that you have undertaken, uh, you either deal with uh, the just two-party exchange or uh, a multiple-party exchange. And uh, complexity of exchanges therefore varies with varying situations. I'm going to explain this concept with the help of examples also, and I'm going to refer back to the examples that uh, I have been talking about for the reason of maintaining consistency. Uh, the building blocks of knowledge uh, will make more sense if we draw upon the same or similar examples that uh, you know that we have been learning, and uh, the application of uh, different concepts of nonprofit marketing will make more sense if we draw upon them over and over again. So let us be very consistent about building these blocks of knowledge. A two-party exchange is a pretty straightforward kind of a thing, and it is something which is given by one party and taken by another. And obviously, we are talking here about you know, costs and benefits, because one party pays costs and gets a benefit in return. And that benefit in return, you see, is uh, the gotten out of the uh, exchange that has taken place. And marketing people are instrumental in creating that exchange and uh, they're trying to uh, bring about a change uh, in the behavior of the target audience. So 
Let us move on to the, the multiple party exchange because that carries more complexity than um, a two party exchange. Uh, this is not uh, very straightforward. It has so many dimensions to it. And those dimensions are the ones that I've been talking about. And we all are on the same page, hopefully, uh, on uh, those dimensions. And basically, those are about different constituents that uh, we have been uh, trying to connect with each other in order to make our program rather coherent and, and cohesive. So here, we are talking about uh, certain additional parties uh, who are part of the exchange. And uh, since these parties are going to have uh, a lot of influence over the uh, decisions that uh, the marketing people want uh, their target market to uh, make, um, these uh, the parties play a very important role. Going back to the example of the, the food bank, it is the activists or uh, the bunch of volunteers who convince the target market about uh, their accepting the food distributed by the food bank. Similarly, when we talk about the example of nursing home, let us now look at that example from the standpoint of uh, the cost marketing and a cost marketing relationship. Let us talk about uh, the hospitals and the hospitality the businesses, the meaning restaurants and also hotels uh, who are willing to extend some kind of help in kind to make sure that the nursing home operates in certain social matters that are just like uh, a hospitality facility. In other words, they should have uh, all the features uh, exhibited by you know, the hotels and the restaurants, a place where uh, those residents do not feel they have been abandoned, a place you know, where they feel that uh, they are spending the remaining uh, the part of their life uh, in a very comfortable way. So these people or these constituents or these others factor play a dominant role because they have an influence on the decision process of yet another others group that is going to make the decision for the residents and that is the family members, friends and their relatives because they are the ones who are going to make the decision about their elders whether to go to the nursing home or not. And let me uh, add here, uh, just for the sake of interest, that nursing home is not something negative, which generally is the perception here. Nursing homes are going to be the thing of the future, uh, given the fact that uh, the most of the young people, or rather young couples, are going to be in the job market because of the economic factors. And uh, they, there may not be uh, people left at home to take care of the elders. And it is because of that reason that elders are shifted to nursing homes. They're not shifted to nursing homes because their young ones do not like them and they want to abandon them. That's not the fact. And therefore, you see the marketing uh, mindset in terms of developing this kind of a facility in years to come, it may be a good point for you to ponder. Back to the multiple party exchanges, um, we have seen two examples fitting very well into the concept of the multiple party exchange. And those two examples are the ones I keep talking over and over again. And I would like to say once again that all the concepts that we learn, we learn those in a sequence, component after component. But when it comes to application of those concepts to the actual practical world, you know, you have to drop on, you know, so many different concepts simultaneously, meaning at the same time, and uh, then looking at the overall marketing situation in terms of strategy formulation and strategy execution and implementation. And therefore, um, talking about um, these uh, the concepts in relation to the same example is going to help you while you come up with a marketing plan for any given uh, NPO. The important thing about the, um, the constitution of uh, uh, the exchange, uh, especially when it comes to multiple party exchange, is that you as marketing people have to influence not just the target market, but all those constituents that are connected uh, with the target market. And therefore, um, you are going to have to deal with all those parties that are related to the target market. After uh, having understood the uh, types of um, exchanges, uh, let us now move on to the duration of exchanges. Well, there are 
of two different types. Okay, the one is um, a single transaction or a single time uh, the exchange, uh, the, whereas the other one is kind of a continual exchange okay, which continues okay, the, over a number of okay, the years. What is a single time or a single transaction exchange is again a pretty straightforward thing. The example of this kind of an exchange could be the medical treatment given to somebody in case of an accident. And uh, this you know, takes us back to the example of human services. Another example could be getting inoculated okay, because that is kind of okay, the one-time thing. Okay, there are certain uh, inoculations okay, which are carried out just okay, the once in the lifetime of a human. And there are others that are repeated like you know, the ones in five years or something like that. So this also is kind of um, a fixed exchange, okay, which is a one-time thing. Uh, we have to okay, pay more attention to those exchanges okay, which are continual uh, or which are continuing okay, over a longer period of time. Here, okay, the marketing people have to okay, reinforce their message to the target market because they want the changed behavior to stay. The meaning, the once a change has been achieved, then the job of the marketing people is to make sure that the change doesn't go away. This is the equivalent of uh, the maintaining the, your uh, customers on the commercial side. This is uh, what you call customer loyalty you know, on the commercial side. And it is because of that loyalty that they stay uh, with one particular brand. And uh, you as um, a non-profit marketer have to make sure that uh, the influence uh, that you have, um, you have exerted uh, the, over the target market as a result of which the target market has uh, the brought about a change stays there uh, for times to come. And for that, you have to continue your marketing effort. You're not to stop it there. And uh, this again, you see, is the equivalent of uh, customer relationship management, uh, the CRM uh, uh, on the other side of uh, the management and uh, the marketing. Let's take the example of smoking. You know, the smokers have a tendency to go back to smoking once they have left it behind. And the job of the marketing is to reinforce the message over and over again so that people don't really undo the behavior which is to their benefit. And therefore, the marketing effort goes on, on and on. We have to develop a requisite understanding of consumer behavior. This may sound like a very generalized kind of a statement because I already have talked about the role of exchange and um, the types of exchange and what really influences uh, consumer behavior. But uh, the understanding should not stop there at the, uh, the model of BCOS, which uh, has become the acronym and uh, may also be um, pronounced as because, uh, because that really uh, makes it easy for all of us to remember uh, what are the four drivers of uh, consumer behavior. Here, in this uh, particular component, I would like to develop understanding on part of all of us. What are the other uh, the marketing considerations that uh, you have to bring uh, into deliberations uh, when you are looking into uh, the consumer behavior? Uh, why people behave the way they do? I keep saying this sentence again and again because it really speaks volumes. And uh, the starting with uh, the simple concept of uh, application of the principles of marketing mix to um, uh, dilating uh, on those principles and getting into positioning and segmentation and communication campaigns and so on and so forth. The whole thing is uh, very comprehensive. And uh, therefore, uh, we've got to understand uh, why consumers behave the way they do. One of the basic considerations is understanding of demography. The reason I talk about demography is because two different segments of the market cannot behave in similar ways. Just try to look at one segment which happens to have uh, the low income distribution. Now here I'm talking about demographic features. With uh, low income distribution feature, is this segment going to respond to a cause which deals with improving the environment of the city? I mean, you're talking about making the city green or greener, and uh, you're talking about the need not to cut trees, you're talking about the need to have more vegetation here and there, you think that you should be talking with uh, a segment of the market which uh, is uh, low income and low education in terms of its uh, demographic features? I think the answer is going to be no, a straight, flat no. 
And therefore, an understanding of the demography is extremely important when we are dealing with uh, the different market segments and are trying to establish uh, their uh, the behaviors, uh, what are the values and beliefs, and uh, how those values and beliefs could be influenced uh, with the help of your programs, with the help of uh, the social pressures which you and your side uh, build up to uh, make people uh, change their uh, the sets of uh, uh, values and beliefs. And therefore, uh, the demography is the foremost when it comes to uh, understanding uh, the consumer behavior. We have uh, fully understood the role of demographics in um, understanding consumer behavior. Now uh, we've got to elevate this understanding to a little more sophisticated level of psychographics. We've got to understand uh, what are the similarities of features exhibited by people originally belonging to different demographic groups so in other words, we've got to mark where the demographic lines cross each other in order to get into the area of psychographics where people from different demographic groups have similar qualities or similar features in terms of the marketing perspective. Let us talk about an example of a musical concert which you are going to organize as an effort rather as a one-time promotional effort uh, toward generating funds for, of course, a noble cause that you are working on. The major objective of uh, organizing this concert would be the who to invite and who not. Or in other words, who are the people uh, to whom you really can sell tickets? And uh, you take a look at uh, you know, different demographics and uh, then attempt to look for those features among those segments of population that have a similarity or that may have a similarity of thinking and passion for the cause that you are promoting and also the event that you are organizing. So here, you're not going to have people who have a dislike for the musical concert and people who may come to the concert may uh, come from a broad demographic base. So with the help of psychographics, you determine what kind of features uh, give a common sense of uh, passion to a broad uh, spectrum of uh, the population that originally belong uh, to different demographic groups. Uh, you will be in a better position to understand the consumer behavior if you really look into psychographics. As a matter of fact, without uh, psychographics, uh, it is uh, hard for the marketing people to uh, move forward toward their uh, strategic process. And uh, much of it is going to be talked about uh, in the coming components as part of uh, the segmentation. Um, but we have to wait until that time. The Next uh, factor uh, or the marketing consideration that uh, is very important toward understanding consumer behavior is the factor of causation. We have to understand what causes what. We have to develop links between uh, the different behaviors. Why is it that a young group of people or a young segment of people like to donate toward a certain cause? It may be the cancer treatment facility or the kidney treatment facility and if young people are donating toward that cause, could we've got to determine could, why is it that? Is it because they happen to be young professionals? Or is it because uh, the young people with uh, the disposable income are in the process of improving their social values, could, which was not the case uh, could, previously? I mean, I'm just talking hypothetically, and I'm not saying that young people never had you know, good values or young people are improving their social values. I'm just talking about to see a hypothetical situation to... Um, draw on a certain concept. Why is it that uh, the elderly people could like to donate more uh, toward a certain cause? Again, you see a cancer facility or a kidney treatment facility. Is it because they have fulfilled all the responsibilities of educating their children and the marrying their children and uh, they now have a lot more disposable income and donating uh, that disposable income toward a social cause uh, is very dear to them. So you, you must know as marketing people who are the segments uh, who could be your target market and how they behave and why they behave so. 
uh, the once you have uh, the, all these uh, the facts and figures, the, you can put together your uh, the marketing strategic process uh, the much more appropriately than otherwise. Why is it that people in the, in the Middle Ages are constrained to make donations uh, towards certain noble causes, despite the fact that uh, they have been approached and uh, the marketing people really have uh, the worked on them, but still, there is no way that uh, the you as NPO the marketing managers are in a position to extract the kind of funding that which you were expecting. Is it because uh, they have uh, a lot more commitments than those young professionals who are still in the early 30s uh, or the elderly people who have uh, fulfilled their all worldly responsibilities? So uh, once you have an accurate set of information about uh, the different segments, know their demographics and, and psychographics, the, you are in a better position to connect different constituents uh, of the marketing plan and uh, to make your program uh, more effective. The question here is, uh, we have developed the understanding uh, what are the links responsible for uh, developing relationships between the one cause and another. The meaning, the cause for donating money is that you have you know, some beautiful values and you want to donate toward a particular noble cause. And you happen to be young, you are a young professional, you have a lot more disposable income and so on and so forth. But why is it that the people have those underlying motives? Why is it that they behave the way they do? I mean, I'm talking out of a hypothetical situation that those young people may have you know, good values and they may have uh, a lot more disposable income than um, people from other segments of uh, the demographic base. But the question is, we've got to understand that in a more appropriate, in a more structured uh, the way, which is uh, more authentic, which is reliable. Well, there are two different sources uh, to determine that. The one is through experience. If your management team happens to be very experienced in terms of your programs, then the cumulative experiential cash or the corporate memory, the corporate knowledge, they are so great that you always can draw upon them and come up with decisions which in most of the cases are accurate. So drawing on your experience and making decisions uh, on the basis of your positive past experience is one of the sources of uh, knowing uh, why the links develop between different causes. And what really is it that actuate people to behave in a certain way? The other source to establish all that is through, we all know, marketing research. And uh, we can um, establish uh, the better structured findings uh, by way of conducting marketing research and uh, then uh, get, to get into a more uh, uh, the organized uh, the marketing program. And uh, as part of uh, the marketing research, uh, what we uh, try to establish is, you know, um, not only why people behave the way they do, uh, but also get leads into forming different segments and so on and so forth. So one thing leads to another, and that is going to be the topic of, uh, you know, the coming uh, segments of learning. Um, thanks for